Welcome to the Sunday School lesson for January 8th, 2023. For those of you that are new, I teach Sunday School at Falmouth Baptist Church in Falmouth, Kentucky, and the materials I use are the LifeWay materials. As always, I like to open with a word of prayer, so if you would, bow with me and we'll have a word of prayer, then we'll get into the lesson. Dear Lord, we just thank you for allowing us to come together today, and Father, at this time, we just uh, pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us and guide us through this lesson, that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, that we may grow closer to you and learn more about you and your will and your will for us in our lives, Father. And Father, during this time, I do want to lift up those that are struggling, those that have lost loved ones. Lord, just uh, pray for the comforting peace that you provide. Father, we just want to thank you for the many blessings that you've given us. Father, we especially want to lift up those that are lost and just pray that as your Holy Spirit calls to them, that they will respond. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you following along in your Bible, we are reading out of the book of Zephaniah today in the Old Testament. Uh, Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 9 through 20. Um, a book that uh, I've not really seen a lot of Sunday school lessons in uh, over the years and don't really hear... Uh, Pastors preach on Zephaniah a whole lot, it doesn't seem like. So maybe a unfamiliar uh, book to you. But uh, we're finishing up uh, the final lesson on fear and putting fear in its place and overcoming fear. We've been doing it for the past five weeks. This is the sixth and final lesson. Next week, we'll start a new six-week series on how to discern the voice of God. But as for today, uh, we'll be, again, finishing up on topic of fear. The title of our lesson today is Joy in Place of Fear, and the point of the lesson is fear will be a thing of the past in God's eternal kingdom. Question of the week, when has looking forward to a future reward helped you persevere? When has just looking forward to some ultimate goal helped you continue on through a difficult task? Uh, I'm a sports person. Uh, it made me think back to, to my football days Back in the old days, uh, <laughs> my glory days, uh, and just thinking about all those times that, you know, going to practice. And in the summer, you would have two-a-days where you'd go to practice in the morning, and then you'd go back in later in the afternoon or the evening. Uh, and it was in August, and it was hot. And the field we practiced on uh, really had no grass. It was an old dirt baseball field that our team often practiced on. Uh, we weren't allowed to practice on the field. That had this the playing field, that had to stay in good shape for the games. We didn't have all the artificial turfs and all the neat stuff they have today. Um, so, you know, and those were days that sometimes you just didn't really feel like it. But, um, you know, looking forward to the games, I mean, I was not a practice person. There were times I liked practice because I liked getting out there, hitting people and having fun. And then there were other days you just kind of dreaded it because it was just hard. And, and you know, you were doing things over and over that seemed kind of mundane. But, the games, you know, that came up, whether you win or lose, you loved playing the game, or at least I did. So things that you look forward to um, and, you know, things that that future reward. Uh, some of you know I've had problems with my back that's caused problems with my legs. I've been doing physical therapy and just had some exercise equipment yesterday that will hopefully help me continue with my progress on that. And, you know, hoping for that reward that comes spring, I'll be able to get out and do more things than I was able to do you know, this past summer and spring, you know, just going to persevere because I'm looking forward to things getting better. Um, the background on our lesson today, again, as I say, we're on in Zephaniah. Uh, there's not a whole lot that's known about the prophet Zephaniah. His name stand, uh, translation means Yahweh is hidden. And he lived during the reign of Josiah, the king of Judah, uh, at approximately 640 to 609 BC. And up preceding Josiah's reign and during the first 13 years of, of Josiah's reign, the people were wallowing in sin and idolatry. And throughout the book of Zephaniah, especially the early portions of it, you know, the prophet spoke about God's anger and his judgment and warning the people of the coming judgment. And he warned the nations of what was called the terrible day of the Lord. You know, again, that day that judgment was coming, they were going to have to pay for their their transgressions, if you will. But after warning and issuing all these warnings in our lesson, in our book today, the materials that we're talking about today, after issuing all of God's warning of anger and punishment uh, that is to come, 
He also promised that God would restore his people, that at the end of everything, for those that persevere, there would be restoration. So we'll go ahead and read the verses. Again, Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 9 through 20. Uh, we'll read through them, and then we'll come back and talk about them a little bit. For I will then restore pure speech to the people, so that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him with a single purpose. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my supplicants, my dispersed people, will bring an offering to me. On that day you will not be put to shame because of everything you have done in rebelling against me. For then I will, will remove from among you your jubilant, arrogant people, and you will never again be haughty or on, a whole, on my holy mountain. I will leave a meek and humble people among you, and they will take refuge in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will no longer do wrong or tell lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will pasture and lie down with nothing to make them afraid. Sing for joy, daughter of Zion. Shout loudly, Israel. Be glad and celebrate with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has removed your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord, is among you. You need no longer fear harm. On that day it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is among you, a warrior who saves. Who He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will be quiet in his love. He will delight in you with singing. I will gather those who have been driven from the appointed festivals. They will be a tribute from you and a reproach on her. Yes, at that time I will deal with all who oppress you. I will save the lame and gather the outcast. I will make those who are disgraced throughout the earth receive praise and fame. At that time, I will bring you back. Yes, at that time, I will gather you. I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes. The Lord has spoken. So again, we start out there in verse 9. And again, leading up to that point, um, Zephaniah is issuing a lot, a lot of warnings. And after warning and condemning evil, Zephaniah changes his focus in verse 9. He now focused on a future promise of spiritual and national renewal. If you look at the verses, he's talking to the people of Judah. He's talking to the people of the city of Jerusalem and then also to all nations. And he says at that time, after this time of, of judgment, after this time of, of punishment, he says, I, for I will then restore. After judgment will come the day when goodness returns. He says he'll restore the pure speech. Uh, instead of using their language to uh, worship pagan gods, you know, that their, their voices would now be purified. Their voices would be used so that they could call on the name of the Lord. You know, he would remove from their, their language, their perverted language that they had sort of intermingled with and, and used to worship pagan gods uh, and restore it to the language of God. The God, that, you know, the language that praised God and called on God, you know, that they would abandon false deities and verbally worship the one true God. And it says then to serve God with a single purpose, talking about humanity being unified in their faith and actions. You know, it's not often that we're unified in anything in this world. It doesn't seem like uh, in the secular world, there's a lot of disunity. Uh, sadly, in the church world, uh, there's a lot of disunity at times, but you know, God says that there will come a time when we will be unified. Uh, this past week, um, those of you that were watching Monday Night Football saw, you know, a horrible thing happen, but then also saw a great thing happen. You know, when a player collapsed and had, went into cardiac arrest and literally died on the field. But what happened with those around him? You had two opposing factions, two opposing teams that were just moments before wanting to beat each other's heads in, if you will. Suddenly, the whole thing changed, and they were unified in purpose. They were unified in prayer, prayer on the football field by these men, prayer in the stands. And in the following days, you, you saw prayer, even on TV, even on ESPN, anchors praying. You know, there was a sense of unity. Can you imagine the sense of unity that God has when he calls his people home to him, when he restores his people when he forgives us of our sins, the unity that we will come. And it says, you know, our reaction in verse 10 there, God's people would bring him gifts, would bring offerings to him. 
you know, from the farthest parts of the known world, those places he listed, those were the farthest parts of the world that was known to Zephaniah, to the writer. He says, on that day, on a day of restoration, those who will repent will not be put to shame for their past sins, for the things that they had done in the past on the day of judgment. You know, this is all looking sort of to a future event. On the day of judgment, you know, our sins have been forgiven. We will not be put to shame if we are saved in Christ because of those past things. Instead, look what he says for those that don't repent. God will remove the arrogant, the prideful, the, those that refuse to repent. God will remove them. And he says they will be replaced by a meek and humble people that will take refuge in the name of the Lord. The remnant that's left, the saved, will turn from evil. They it says they will pasture and lie down with nothing to make them afraid. You know, the symbolism of, of, the, of a shepherd and his sheep. You know, sheep won't rest, sheep won't eat eat if they are afraid. But here is a, a pasture of sheep that are no longer afraid because their Savior has come. You know, speaking about us, speaking about Jesus Christ, that we should have no fear when that day of judgment comes if we're faithful in him. And it says, as a follow-up to the promise to rescue his people, when we move on to verse 14, he says, he, Zephaniah issues four commands. God issues four commands through Zephaniah to those that are rescued. First of all, he says, sing for joy. You know, God wanted them to demonstrate their joy in song. You know, how many times when we're happy are we singing? When we have joy in our heart, are we singing? You know, whether you sing in the shower or just something makes you happy and you start singing. Uh, it's a natural response, and we should sing for joy on that day. The next thing he says is shout loudly. Uh, another way of demonstrating joy, shouting loudly. And, you know, think about that in, in our secular world. Uh, if you're, you know, I just talked about sports. If you're a sports fan, how many times did you shout loudly when your team did something that you wanted to have happen? Can you imagine shouting loudly because God has restored us? He says, be glad be glad. And then finally, he says, celebrate with all your heart that day of judgment, that day of when we're forgiven, when we are restored as a people of God. He says, celebrate with all your heart. And then verse 15, he, he reminds him of why they should do all these things, why they should be joyous. First of all, he says, the Lord has removed your punishment, the day of judgment. If you have repented, if you're saved, your punishment has been removed by Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us. And he says he's turned back your enemy. All those worldly things, all those earthly problems and people that maybe attacked you or worked against you, they've been turned away. And he says the Lord is among you. God is among you. He is with you. And he says, you. number four, he says you need no longer to fear harm. You know, no evil, no disaster in that day of restoration after the day of judgment, when the day of judgment come, he says in verse 16, on that day, the day God's judgment is complete, he says, do not fear. If you are saved, you have nothing to fear. He says, don't let your hands grow weak. The idea of someone who's working and they've just sort of given up out of despair and their hands just fall to their sides out of despair. He says, don't do that. Don't give up. Don't give in to despair and hopelessness, um, you know, or powerlessness. Verse 17, he says, your security is guaranteed. He says, the Lord, your God is among you, a warrior who saves. <clears throat> when the Lord comes, he'll declare victory. God will celebrate over his people. It says, he will rejoice over you with gladness. Can you imagine that? God rejoicing with gladness over your salvation. He will take delight in his people. It says, he will be quiet in his love. You know, God's soothing, unconditional love that calms all of our fears will be there. And he will delight, <clears throat> says he will delight in you with singing. Can you imagine God singing? You know, he will delight, you know, people living in a right relationship with him. Bring joy, bring God joy, bring, you know, God cause to celebrate for us. The last set of verses, 18 through 20, now God speaks. You know, up to this point, Zephaniah has been delivering the message. Now he delivers God's the message. You know, God speaks 
here. Um, and verse 18 is a little bit difficult to translate. You know, uh, the Hebrew is translated in different translations of the Bible. Uh, different versions have a little bit different translations. You know, I will gather those who have been driven from the appointed festival. You know, for those that have been outcast in society, um, you know, he says, I will gather them. You know, those that have repented, um, you know, all the reasons to fear judgment will be removed. And he will find relief from the burden of sin. We will find that. In verse 19, you know, at some future day, our fears will be over. That future day, the day of ultimate judgment, you know, our fears will be over. Um, it says God promises several blessings that he will bring to his people when we're restored. Uh, at that time, at that day of judgment, he says, I will deal with all who oppress you. Verse 19, I will deal with all who oppress you. The lame will be rescued from their suffering, and he will gather the outcasts. You know, the, the outcast of society, the secular outcast, the, out, the, the people that this world have pushed aside. You know, as Christians, sometimes we are outcast. Um, you know, he says he'll gather them. Those of us that have been driven from, from the land, you know, will be brought home and be restored. You know, when God's ultimate judgment comes, those of us that have maybe been ridiculed in this life for our faith, um, you know, he says that, that don't have to worry about that anymore. You're going to be called home. You're going to be with me. Uh, those who have been humiliated in the past will receive praise and fame. I think it's interesting. You know, I, I mentioned the football game. You know, I think about other times back to like 9-11. How many people, you know, they stood on the Capitol steps, you know, singing God bless America and how quickly people turn their back on God. You know, he says, and, and sometimes, you know, we're humiliated for doing so. I've seen on social media talking about, uh, you know, how Tim Tebow was ridiculed for praying on the football field. And now we have two teams that are being praised for praying on a football field. But how quickly will that praise turn to ridicule in our society? And God says, you know, those of you who are humiliated, you'll receive praise and fame. You know, at that time, he says, I will bring you back. I will gather you. You know, a future promise that we can count on. No matter what we face in this lifetime, God keeps his promises. One day suffering and fear will be over. We will experience eternal restoration in God's kingdom. You know, when Jesus returns, we will be restored and fear will be no more. You know, I go back to my opening question. You know, that opening question, when is looking forward to a future reward helped you persevere? You know, sometimes when we're in the midst of, of our struggles, when we're in the midst of trouble, it's easy to have fear. It's easy to have doubts. And, and it's natural, I think, sometimes for us to have that. But thinking about the future, the future promise, the promise of what is to come, that should help us to persevere, to overcome fear that no matter what happens in this life and in this world, if we have Jesus Christ and if we are saved, none of that you know, none of that should cause us to fear because ultimately we will be restored. We will be called home. God will gather his people. And that's the focus of this lesson. You know, fear will be a thing of the past in God's eternal kingdom. So uh, I'll wrap up with that. Um, again, I always like to invite, if you're in the Northern Kentucky, uh, Central Kentucky area, Falmouth Baptist Church, if you don't have a church home, we'd love for you to join us at the corner of 4th and Maple. Uh, here in Falmouth, and if not, uh, Brother Cohen will uh, be on Facebook uh, with services on the Facebook page, uh, Falmouth Baptist Church Facebook page. Sunday school is at 945, worship services at 1045. But wherever you are, find a church home. I, I appreciate it, and I appreciate the fact that we can do these lessons uh, virtually, and uh, many of you have commented that you enjoy the lessons and that they're useful and beneficial to you, and I, I and, and I'm grateful for that. I'm thankful to God for that. I just prayed he uses them as he would have them to be used. But there's no substitution, if you can do it, if you can physically do it, to be personally involved in your local church. So find you a church if you're not involved and get involved in one. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll close. And um, you know we'll uh, be back, Lord willing, next week, starting a whole new series on recognizing the voice of God how to know when God is speaking to us. So God bless, have a good week and uh, 
Again, Lord willing, we'll be back next week.